Hello everyone, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're covering chapter 8 for our MCAT physics and math playlist and this chapter is titled Light and Optics. In this chapter we're going to cover the following objectives. We're going to start with the electromagnetic spectrum. Here we're going to discuss the nature of electromagnetic waves and focus on the visible spectrum to understand how energy travels through space. Next, we're going to dive into geometrical optics. This is a dense section where we're going to explore reflection, refraction, and lenses, examining how light behaves at different surfaces and media. Third, we're going to discuss diffraction. Here we're going to go over the concept of interference and we're going to analyze how light spreads through a single slit, a slit lens system, and multiple slits. Finally, we'll review polarization by defining plane polarized and circularly polarized light, ultimately learning how light's orientation can be manipulated. With that introduction, Let's go ahead and get started with our first objective. We're going to begin with discussing the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, one of the ways that energy travels through space is by electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation, or EMR, is a form of energy that moves as oscillating electric and magnetic fields propagating at the speed of light. These oscillations are perpendicular to each other and to the direction of the wave's travel, and that makes electromagnetic radiation unique in its ability to carry energy across vast distances, even through a vacuum. To fully understand electromagnetic radiation, it's important to recognize its three defining characteristics, wavelength, frequency, and speed. Wavelength, frequency, and speed are all related through this equation right here. This equation says that the speed of electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum is equal to wavelength multiplied by frequency. Now the speed of electromagnetic radiation in the vacuum is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Wavelength is defined as the distance between two consecutive peaks or two consecutive troughs in a wave. Frequency is defined as the number of wave cycles passing a specific point in space per second. Now the relationship between wavelength and frequency is inversely proportional. So as wavelength decreases, frequency increases, and vice versa. The electromagnetic spectrum itself, it encompasses a vast range of wavelengths and frequencies, each corresponding to different types of radiation with unique characteristics. Starting from the longest wavelengths, we have radio waves, which range from about 10 to the 6 meters down to 1 meter. These waves are widely used for communication, such as in radio and television broadcasts. Next, we encounter microwaves with wavelengths between one meter and one millimeter, which are commonly used in radar and for heating food in microwave ovens. Moving into shorter wavelengths, we reach infrared region, spanning from one millimeter to 700 nanometers. Infrared radiation is primarily associated with heat and it's used in applications like thermal imaging. Next, we have our visible light range. This includes wavelengths detectable by the human eye and that ranges from 700 nanometers, which we perceive as red, down to 400 nanometers, which we perceive as violet. This visible spectrum is a major focus of this chapter because it directly relates to human vision and practical optical applications. Beyond visible light, 
we have ultraviolet radiation. This covers wavelengths from about 400 nanometers down to about 50 nanometers. Ultraviolet light has higher energy and it can cause ionization, which is why it can lead to sunburn and other biological effects. Next, we have x-rays with wavelengths between 50 nanometers and about 10 to the negative two nanometers. They're known for their medical imaging uses because x-rays have the ability to penetrate soft tissues, allowing us to view structures inside the body. Finally, at the shortest end of the spectrum, we find gamma rays with wavelengths less than 10 to the negative two nanometers. These extremely energetic waves are produced in nuclear reactions and certain cosmic events. It becomes clear to us looking at this that each region of the electromagnetic spectrum has distinct properties and applications that are influenced by its wavelength and frequency. And this diversity allows electromagnetic radiation to interact with matter in various ways, from transmitting radio signals to penetrating the body for medical imaging. To tie this back to what we said earlier, as electromagnetic radiation moves through space, it generates oscillating electric and magnetic fields along its path. This interrelationship between electricity and magnetism reflects the intrinsic unity of these two forces. A changing electric field induces a magnetic field and vice versa. And this oscillation behavior allows electromagnetic radiation to propagate as discrete packets of energy or photons, which interact with matter in a diverse manner. With that, we've completed objective one, and we can go ahead and move into objective two. In this objective, we're gonna cover geometrical optics. To start, let's look at how light behaves when it travels through a medium with a uniform composition, a homogeneous medium. In this medium, Light moves in a straight line, which is a behavior we call rectilinear propagation. However, when the light reaches a boundary between two different materials, say air and water, its path can change. This shift in direction is explained by the principles of geometrical optics, which help us understand how light interacts with surfaces. Geometrical optics, they cover key phenomena like reflection and refraction, which form the foundation for understanding mirrors and lenses. Let's begin with reflection. Reflection happens when light strikes a surface and it bounces back into its original medium instead of passing through. This behavior is governed by the law of reflection which states that the angle at which light hits the surface, called the angle of incidence, is equal to the angle at which it reflects off the surface, known as the angle of reflection. Both of these angles are measured in relation to a line perpendicular to the surface, called the normal. To reiterate, the law of reflection states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Reflection is central to how mirrors create images. In general, images produced are classified as either real or virtual. A real image is one where light rays actually meet at a point, meaning that if you placed a screen there, you would see the image on the screen. In contrast, a virtual image forms when the light rays only appear to come from a point behind the mirror, even though they don't actually converge there. Now for plain mirrors, the images are typically virtual and upright because the reflected rays stay parallel and do not converge. To build on this a little more, one important property of plain mirrors is that they don't cause 
the reflected light rays to converge or diverge. So when parallel light rays hit a plane mirror, they remain parallel after reflection. Since a plane mirror has no curvature, it doesn't bring the rays together or spread them apart. And this lack of convergence means that plane mirrors always produce virtual images. The reflected light stays in front of the mirror, but the image appears to be the same distance behind the mirror as the object is in front, and this creates the illusion that the light rays originate from a point behind the mirror, again, even though no actual rays pass that point. Interestingly enough, we can think of plane mirrors as a special type of spherical mirror with an infinite radius of curvature. And this is going to make more sense after we cover spherical mirrors and we define the radius of curvature. So let's do that next. Spherical mirrors come in two main varieties, concave and convex. A concave mirror has an inwardly curved reflective surface, like the inside of a sphere, which causes light rays to converge or come together. In contrast, a convex mirror has an outwardly curved surface, similar to the outside of a sphere, and it causes light rays to diverge or spread apart. To understand how these mirrors work, we have to define some key terms related to their geometry. Let's go ahead and get started with center of curvature. This is the center of the imaginary sphere from which the mirror segment is taken. It's located on the optical axis at a distance from the mirror surface equal to the mirror's radius of curvature. The radius of curvature, denoted as lowercase r, this is the distance between the mirror's surface and the center of curvature. Then we have the focal point, denoted as capital F. This is a crucial point on the optical axis where parallel rays of light upon reflection either converge or appear to diverge. The focal point is positioned halfway between the mirror and the center of curvature. The focal length, denoted as lowercase f, this is the distance from the mirror to the focal point. Then we have the principal axis. This is the straight line that passes through the center of curvature and the midpoint of the mirror surface. The object distance, denoted lowercase o, this is the distance between the object and the mirror, and this is in contrast to the image distance, denoted lowercase i, which is the distance between the resulting image and the mirror. Lastly, we have magnification. This is the ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object. It also corresponds to the ratio of the image distance to the object distance, and it helps us understand the relative size and orientation of the image. Now, there's an important relationship that links these distances together, and it's known as the mirror equation. This equation says 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance, and that is equal to 2 divided by r, where r is the radius of curvature. This equation allows us to calculate the position of an image formed by a spherical mirror based on the object distance and the focal length. By convention, if the image distance i is positive, then the image is real and it's located in front of the mirror. If i is negative, then the image is virtual and it appears behind the mirror. We can also determine 
the size and orientation of the image using the magnification formula. The magnification formula says that the magnification is equal to the negative of I, which is the image distance, divided by O, which is the object distance. The negative sign here indicates that a positive magnification results in an upright image, while a negative magnification results in an inverted image. So keep in mind that if the absolute value of magnification is less than one, then the image is smaller than the object. If the absolute value of magnification is greater than one, then the image is larger than the object, and if it's just equal to one, then the image and the object are the same size. Understanding these principles helps us predict the behavior of light as it reflects off of spherical mirrors. So for example, concave mirrors can produce both real and virtual images depending on the object's position relative to the focal point. Convex mirrors, however, always produce virtual images that are upright and reduced in size. We definitely want to elaborate on that some more. Now, one thing we could use to help us visualize how these images form when we're discussing convex and concave mirrors, for example, is by using ray diagrams. Ray diagrams are a valuable tool for approximating where an image will appear, its size, and whether it's going to be upright or inverted. And you can do this by tracing the path of the light rays as they reflect off of the mirror's surface. Now, this is a great tool, but sometimes it's not the most practical tool when you're taking a timed exam and an exam that is specifically very high stress. So I'm gonna take a bit of a different approach and just cover some of the different scenarios you can encounter. Let's start with convex mirrors. A convex mirror has an outwardly curved reflective surface, which causes incoming light rays to diverge after reflection. Because these rays diverge, they spread apart, they don't actually meet in front of the mirror. Instead, they appear to come from a point behind the mirror, forming a virtual image. This virtual image is always upright and reduced in size compared to the object. And these convex mirrors are commonly used in applications like vehicle side mirrors, where a wider field of view and smaller upright images are beneficial. Now let's turn to concave mirrors, which have an inwardly curved reflective surface. The type of image a concave mirror produces really depends on the object's position relative to two key points, the focal point and the center of curvature. So here we're gonna cover a couple of scenarios. Our first case is when the object is beyond the center of curvature. Here, the mirror forms an image that is real, inverted, and reduced in size. This image appears between the focal point and the center of curvature. The second case is when the object is at the center of curvature. Here, the image formed is real, inverted, and the same size as the object. In this case, the image appears at the center of curvature. The third case is when the object is between the center of curvature and the focal point. The mirror produces an image that is real, inverted, and enlarged, and it's gonna be located beyond the center of curvature. Our fourth case is when the object is at the focal point. Here, no image is formed because the reflected rays become parallel and they do not converge or diverge to create an image. And finally, we're gonna consider when the object is between the focal point and the mirror. In this case, the image is virtual, upright, and enlarged, 
and it appears behind the mirror, giving the impression that the light rays are originating from a point behind the mirror. Now, we're going to see more of this later in our problem sets, but before we get to that, let's look at this table that summarizes our main takeaways for sign conventions. These conventions are going to help us determine the characteristics of the image based on the values in our equations. For O, which is the object distance, when this is positive, it indicates that the object is in front of the mirror. If this is negative, then the object is considered to be behind the mirror, which is uncommon, but it can apply in certain optical setups. Then we have our image distance. When that is positive, all right, that means that the image is formed in front of the mirror, indicating a real image. On the other hand, if we have a negative value, all right, then this is suggesting that the image appears behind the mirror, and that image is virtual. Now, for radius of curvature and for the focal length, for concave mirrors, both the radius of curvature and the focal length are positive because these mirrors have an inward curvature. For convex mirrors, both values are negative due to the outward curvature. Then finally, we can discuss magnification. A positive magnification indicates an upright image, while a negative magnification indicates an inverted image. The absolute value of magnification also tells us the relative size of the image compared to the object. And with that, we're going to jump into a practice problem. This problem states an object is placed six centimeters in front of a concave mirror that has a 10 centimeter radius of curvature. Determine the image distance, magnification, whether the image is real or virtual, and whether it is inverted or upright. To solve this problem, we're going to use our optics equation. The equation says that 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over the object's distance plus 1 over the image distance, which is also equal to 2 divided by the radius of curvature. In the problem, we're given the radius of curvature, and we're also given the object distance. We want to figure out the image distance, so we can use this portion of the equation to solve for the image distance. We're gonna go ahead and isolate this variable right here. One over i is equal to two divided by r minus one over o. And we have both of these variables, so we can go ahead and plug them in. Our radius of curvature is 10 centimeters, and our object distance is 6 centimeters. Now we can go ahead and simplify this to be 1 over 5. Now we have 1 over 5 minus 1 over 6. We're going to adjust the denominator so that they have a common denominator. We're going to go ahead and do 30. So to get 5, to be 30, we have to multiply it by 6, and what we do to the denominator, we have to do to the numerator. So 1 over 5 is equivalent to 6 over 30. And we want to do the same thing to 1 over 6. We have to multiply 6 by 5 to get 30. What we do to the denominator, we have to do to the numerator. So 1 over 6 is equivalent to 5 over 30. If we go ahead and subtract, 6 over 30 and 5 over 30, we get 1 over 30. This is equal to 1 over i. We want just i. We want the image distance. So we're going to have to do the reciprocal of both sides, and we get that i is equal to 30 centimeters. A positive value for i signifies that the image is in front of the mirror, and it's therefore real. So we figured out the image distance, 30 centimeters, and we figured out that the image is real. 
Now, how do we figure out if it's going to be inverted or upright? Here we have to look at the value of O, the object distance. If O is greater than zero, which is the case here, then the real image will always be inverted. So that is how we figure out whether the image is inverted or upright. We have to look at the value of the object distance. If it's greater than zero, and I know they look very similar to each other here, this is an O and this is a zero. If the object distance is greater than zero, then the real image will always be inverted. Okay, now for the last thing that we have to calculate and figure out, magnification. The magnification is equal to negative I divided by O. I is image distance, O is object distance. We know the image distance is 30 centimeters. The, we know the object distance is six centimeters. 30 divided by six is equal to five and we cannot forget our negative sign. So the magnification is equal to negative five. Now here, the negative sign on the magnification confirms that the image is inverted. And then we want to look at the absolute value of the magnification. The absolute value of negative five is five. Five is greater than one. When the magnification is greater than one, when the absolute value of the magnification is greater than one, that indicates that the image is enlarged. And with that, we've completed this practice problem. And we're going to go ahead and stop the lecture video here. In the next part, we're going to go ahead and finish this chapter. I hope this was helpful thus far. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.